Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Sarah Scattergood, and I'll be the moderator this evening. In a moment, I'll introduce our speaker, but first we'll take care of some business. Please remain muted with the video off throughout the lecture. You can submit questions at any time during and after the lecture using the Zoom chat feature, and the speaker will answer questions after the lecture as time allows. The contents of this presentation reflect the views of our speaker and do not necessarily reflect the official positions of the Illinois State Archaeological Survey, the Prairie Research Institute, the University of Illinois, or our sponsoring agencies. As I said earlier, my name is Sarah and I'm the Archaeological Projects Coordinator at the Illinois State Archaeological Survey. The survey, also referred to as ISAS, is a division of the Prairie Research Institute at the University of Illinois. With about 70 full-time archaeologists and support staff working throughout the state, we are one of the largest archaeological research institutions in the U.S. Part of our mission is the dissemination of archaeological knowledge about the past to our peers and especially to the public. In that spirit, we're offering a series of webinars to highlight our research. Today, we are pleased to welcome our fourth speaker, Dr. Isabel Holland Lulowitz. Isabel recently joined ISAS as a research archaeologist at our American Bottom Field Station. She completed two bachelor's degrees and her PhD at the University of Georgia, finishing her PhD last fall. Isabel's background includes experience in environmental archaeology, zoo archaeology, stable isotope analysis, and radiocarbon invasion analysis. Much of her research involves the fisher gatherer hunters of coastal Florida and Georgia, with a particular interest in questions that involve local environmental signatures of global climate events, trends in resource utilization and food insecurities, and the relationship between local ecologies and economic institutions. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Isabel Holland Lulowitz. Um, thanks to everyone who is joining us today. Um, I would like to recognize that the University of Illinois and ISAS are located on the ancestral homelands of several tribes. We recognize and acknowledge that we are on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankasha, Wea, Miami, Muscoutin, Odawa, Sawak, um, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, Chickasaw, and other nations. These lands were the traditional territory of these native nations prior to their forced removal, and these lands continue to carry the stories of these nations. This acknowledgement and centering of native peoples is a start as we move forward for the next 150 years. So my research revolves around investigating three, but um, three separate but really connected themes local manifestations of global climate trends and how, so this is how global climate change is translated onto local environments, trends in resource utilization. So here this means how people are using, eating animals and these trends over time. And lastly, um, the ties between local ecologies and economic institutions. And by that, I mean how people organize labor and practices that revolve around how people integrate animals in their, into their communities, whether that be as food as otherwise. So here's a little outline about um, where we're going to go today. First, I'm going to talk about the global climate trends and their local manifestation, um, highlighting the Little Ice Age. I will talk about perspectives on environmental change and indigenous economies. Um, whoops, excuse me. Let's go back up. Um, the Calusa of southwestern Florida, and that's, this is two case studies from one at the Pineland site and then one at Mount Key. Um, then I'll talk about ties and how these uh, case studies can inform us about ties between local ecologies and economies, and then how these research themes can then translate um, into research I have planned for Illinois. So climate changes at a pace that's relative to the human experience, right? And it's on scales that directly affect local ecologies, which then in turn influences the distribution and availability of animal resources. This is especially true for those populations who live within estuarine ecosystems where sea level can act as a primary driving force in the configuration of these ecosystems. 
Thus, it's critical to understand the effects of global climate change on local environments when we seek to understand past economies. Problems arise when archaeological studies link long-term multi-centennial trends in climate change with the changing availability of resources, because most global trends are developed from proxies that are often far removed from our archaeological study areas, especially in the US Southeast and Midwest. More specifically, in doing this, it, one, assumes that global climate trends affected regional and local environmental conditions uniformly. Two, it lacks information on how economic changes articulate with local ecological conditions. And then three, the local signatures continue to be largely misunderstood from an archaeological perspective, all of which then cause a disconnect in our understanding of local animal populations and how people experienced and dealt with environmental change over shorter time spans. Um, this is because these processes operate at vastly different scales, right? And then leads to problems with our understanding of the exact context under which, under which groups manage strategies for resource exploitation in the space of shifting ecologies. So this research that I'm presenting to you today um, starts to address these issues by using data from archaeological sites to understand past ecological conditions, which then, be con which then can be directly related to the economic institutions of these communities. So let's, do, let's talk about the what, where, when, who, and how. Um, so this research explores local environmental conditions as they relate to the onset of the Little Ice Age, which starts around circa 80, 1200 the consequences of such change and how these conditions influence past indigenous socioeconomic relationships. And to do so, I use archeological data from two sites in Southwestern Florida, the Pineland site in Charlotte Harbor and Pine Island Sound area, you can see my mouse there, and the Mount Key site, um, which is located in Estero Bay. Um, this research builds on previous work, uh, most notably done by Victor Thompson, Karen Walker and Bill Marquardt. Um, and some of such work documents the varying relationships between climate change, animals and plants, and subsistence economies over a span of about a thousand years. And so this is first century AD through um, European colonization. However, these socio-ecological relationships remain far less understood for this last final 500 years of this time span. So we're talking 81,000 to 1500. And this is during which a warmer, wetter global climate episode, um, referred to as a medieval warm period, transitioned to a cooler, drier, drier one, so the Little Ice Age. And during which the Calusa, the indigenous populations of Southern Florida, emerged as a powerful society with complex socio-political and socio-economic institutions. And so to do so, I take a perspective that acknowledges this intrinsic relationship between people and their environments. And I use methods of high resolution, high resolution Bayesian statistical modeling of radiocarbon dates, um, zooarchaeological analysis of shellfish and vertebrate refuse, and oxygen isotope geochemistry of marine shell. So I view social and natural systems as coupled and bound entities that don't change linear, linearly or deterministically, right? So this provides a way for us to understand human environmental interactions that recognizes the challenges of living in climatically sensitive, envir sensitive environments like those in Southwestern Florida, and that humans, here we're talking about the Calusa, possess extensive ecological knowledge of these places that where they live and have the ability to act actively manipulate the environment to mitigate changing conditions. Um, so this provides us a jumping off point with which to further empirically explore this intersection between people and their environment. So it's important to understand the historicity of the relationship between people and their environments, right? In thinking about past human environmental interactions, I don't presume the inherent separation between humans and ecosystems or humans and their environment, but humans are rather a part of their ecosystems, both biologically and socially. And the way in which they enculturate their environment can have really profound effects on local ecologies and vice versa. Humans aren't passive respondents to ecological change, but are active agents in changes that can occur within these ecosystems. The landscape function as a, functions as a representation or a material manifestation of this agency. Additionally, when we think about these relationships, we must also take a perspective that allows for the examination of changes in human environmental relationships while acknowledging and incorporating non-human agents of change. 
right? So these are operative processes like changes induced by global climate shifts that are beyond the capability of humans to maintain landscape continuity. Most consider the Holocene, so approximately the last 10,000 years, as climatically boring. Um, but we know there are actually fluctuations that impact the landscape and conditions weren't always ideal, which required the adoption of various strategies to deal with these fluctuations. So here, I use it to examine the stability of Calusa economic institutions to deal with those changes beyond which can be mitigated by people. So let's talk about the climatic period in question. Um, so this is a little ice age um, beginning circa 80, 1200 lasting through 1850. Um, it's generally characterized as a time of relatively cool temperatures, glacial advances, and has several drying episodes, but is punctuated with periods of high climatic variability. Um, there are alpine glacial records that document subcooling events, and then um, there's low solar activity records that also document um, subcooling events. Um, so cooler temperatures, and there are other records that support this variability um, from the Sargasso Sea, Puerto Rico, um, and the Chesapeake Bay. But if you'll notice, all of those are not actually directly um, located in southwestern Florida. Across the southeastern U.S., um, it appears conditions would have become generally cooler, drier, um, with relatively lower sea levels, which so all of this um, generalization provides us a starting point to investigate the impacts of these trends in southwestern Florida. Um, additionally, recent data on global fisheries in the Gulf of Mexico suggests there's a causal link between climatic conditions and fisheries productivity, and that these fisheries can actually reflect changes um, that occurred within the past one to two years. Um, so this makes this area really great because these, fish these fisheries are sensitive enough to reflect change at the annual, um, decadal, and multi-centennial scale. Um, so let's talk about um, a little bit about the environments that we're in. Um, the estuarine systems of the Florida Gulf Coast are vulnerable, low-lying, um, shallow water ecosystems with really small tidal ranges. Um, they're situated along a really long continental shelf, um, which means that minor fluctuations in sea level can actually really dramatically um, impact and compound changes along the shoreline. Um, these are extremely productive ecosystems and provide habitats for a whole range of many different species um, because these, these systems actually trap nutrients and have year-round photosynthesis. Um, based on previous research by my colleagues, we know that the area harbor harbors a long-term um, coupled socio-ecological system. So people have been here living in the environment for a long time, um, which makes this a really ideal location to investigate these trends in local ecologies and economies, right? So we have people living here for a long time and we have really climatically sensitive environments. Um, for this research, I'm gonna highlight the impacts that changes in relative sea level impact salinity regimes within these ecosystems. So I treat salinity as the limiting factor here to the location and availability of different resources in these environments. Um, the lowering of relative sea level in these waters restricts the extent of the saltwater in embayments and causes nearby waters to become less saline. Now, as relative sea level rises, salinities increase, marine conditions expand further into the embayment. And um, this image just shows you that it's a there's a linear relationship between sea level rise and increasing salinity. <clears throat> so you can connect data from the archaeological record to these changes in local salinity. Um, the zooarchaeological record, or rather the remains of animals found in archaeological deposits, can tell us about ecological conditions because organized organisms occupy distinct geographic distributions um, spatially. And these distributions can change through time as ecological conditions change. So when salinity regimes shift, organisms can respond via relocation, reproduction, or altering other aspects of their behavior to adapt to these new conditions. However, while these resources can respond, humans can also alter their economic strategies to either follow the resources when they relocate, adopt alternative types of resources, um, adapt and alter their collection practices to best fit these new conditions, or invest in um, economic strategies that actually foster resilience. So lasting strategies that, you know, it doesn't matter if the environment changes or the resources change place, right? 
So this last strategy requ actually requires extensive knowledge of these systems and the biological characteristics of the resources they use in order for these strategies to work. And that's what I'm arguing that the Calusa, the strategy that is what the Calusa use. So who were they? Um, they were a non-agricultural, so they did not um, partake in maize agriculture or row crop agriculture. Um, fisher hunter gatherers who organized as a complex chiefdom or weak tributary state. And while the exact timing for this kind of emergence of political complexity is unclear, um, the chiefdom-like level of organization that was, was likely in place um, during the latter part of the first millennia AD, um, by the time of European colonization in the 16th century, however, they controlled the entire, entire lower third of peninsular Florida. So in the absence of maize, they relied on aquatic resources, wild plant foods, and cultivated home gardens. Um, given this reliance on resources within these estuarine, heavy reliance on these resources in these estuarine systems, um, ecological conditions undoubtedly played a key role in both how they, um, in both sociopolitical and socioeconomic structuring and then restructuring of these Calusa communities through time. So to investigate the exact nature of these relationships, I use uh, data here from two Calusa sites. Um, the Pineland site here, just again, and the Mount Key site in Estero Bay. Um, the Pineland site complex is located on the western portion of Pine Island, along um, the eastern shores of Pine Island Sound, and more largely within a complex estuarine system comprised of Charlotte Harbor and then Pine Island Sound and San Carlos Bay. Um, freshwater input into the system comes from the Mayaca, Peace, and Clusahatchee Rivers, um, and then is also combined with freshwater runoff. However, the shape of Pine Island um, restricts the amount of freshwater runoff into, the, into Pine Island Sound. Um, and so it actually, both from the rivers and from freshwater runoff is restrictive. Um, so this makes Pine Island Sound an oceanic bay that is often at or near marine values of around 32 parts per thousand salinity. Um, these barrier islands to the west protect it from complete open ocean conditions. Um, and it's also a really shallow sound. Depths only range from about uh, 30 centimeters to 60 centimeters. So if we zoom into the site, um, Pineland has two prominent mid and mound complexes that are bisected by a central canal. Um, There's several water impoundment features and numerous other ridges and mounds all of which were most likely in place by the onset of the Little Ice Age, again, circa 1200 AD. Um, for this research, I use data collected from excavations conducted in 2015 and 2017, which revealed a partially waterlogged midden um, that contained a really well-preserved stratigraphy, as you can see here, um, waterlogged materials that included cordage. So that's, this is an example right here, um, in both long sections and knots, and abundant burned and unburned plant remains and wood debris. Um, there's also abundant shellfish and vertebrate and other botanical remains. Um, important here is that this deposit likely accumulated along the shoreline at the water's edge. Um, so just a little bit of reference, this is four meters in length. So this is, a, this is the same four by one excavation unit. <clears throat> So in order to establish the temporality of these deposits, nine samples of charred wood and one charred seed were um, identified and selected for a radiocarbon analysis. Two radiocarbon dates were selected from each wood specimen with a known number of tree rings in between these two samples, resulting in a total of 19 radiocarbon dates. These dates were calibrated and modeled using Bayesian statistical analysis, which produced it, um, these italicized posterior estimates for the radiocarbon age. And it built in these known age gaps between the two radiocarbon dates. Um, so it estimates that the deposited, deposits started accumulating between 80, 950, and 1020, and ended somewhere between Cal 80, 1430, and 1500. And then for each 10 centimeter level in between, I have, my model estimates date ranges to periods of no more than 30 years. Um, so I'm pretty happy with, the te with my temporal control on these deposits. 
So informed by these radiocarbon dates, then four zooarchaeological zoar samples were analyzed to capture these first few centuries of the Little Ice Age. Um, I screened vertebrate samples to eighth inch and then shellfish samples to 16th inch. And I, I mention this because um, I screen these, this, these shellfish samples to 16th inch because it captures these smaller shellfish species who are more sensitive to ecological conditions, again, i.e. here salinity. Um, and throughout, I'll use M and I, or a minimum number of individuals, as a way to discuss changes in species abundance. Um, some just basic descriptive data here. I had a total of around 1,500. Um, identified vertebrate bones and fragments, and from that estimate a total of 136 vertebrate animals from these four strata. Um, they come from a total of 42 taxa or distinct families. Um, unsurprisingly, the majority of them are bony fishes. And so you can see here the location of all of my um, dates as well. And then these are the model ranges for the four zooarchaeological samples. <laughs> These numbers are a little bigger. Um, in total, I had around 36,000 individual uh, in invertebrate shells and fragments. And from that, I estimated a total of around almost 19,000 um, invertebrate um, individual organisms. So in order to create a model of environmental change based on these samples, all vertebrate species were identified to one of seven environmental designations, which loosely represent different salinity genes present in this estuary today. Um, so this goes from freshwater to oceanic salinity. Um, over 90% of the vertebrate m &I are bony and cartilaginous fishes, um, which can be attributed to um, types mango stream through um, type gulf, generally, um, which again is unsurprising. Um, generally, each environment is represented about evenly um, through time, but this is probably due to the fact that these animals are highly mobile and can be found in multiple environments. Um, if we break this down a little farther, between approximately 70 and 80 percent of the um, M&I vertebrate taxa in each level can be found in shallow water seagrass habitats um, like those found in proximity to the site today. Um, while the diversity of vertebrate species is low, um, the two earlier deposits have species that prefer more saline water, such as scale fin grunts, um, trunkfish, grouper, um, requiem sharks, and hammerheads. Um, so since these fishes are not present in the later samples, it could indicate that we have a shift in local salinity regimes um, to more freshwater starting after these deposits sometime um, circa 80, 1230 to 1255. Uh, but um, let's go to the shellfish. Um, the presence and abundance of certain species changes stratigraphically throughout the samples. Um, if you compare the eastern oyster right here to crested oyster, this uh, you actually have an inverse relationship here um, through the samples. Crested oysters actually live in more restricted habitat ranges as compared to eastern oysters. So they prefer higher salinities at somewhere a minimum of 20 to 25 parts per thousand, while Eastern oyster can live in a much wider range of salinities. Um, you'll also note here, so these are the lower, older samples. These are the higher, earlier samples. They go like this. Um, we have a drop off in all of these species that prefer higher salinities. Um, let's go on. So for the Invertebrate environment designations, I included um, only those found within a single environment. So instead of um, including species that could be found in multiple environments, only a single environment, here there's a decrease in percent of total taxa and percent MNI over time for those taxa who prefer higher saline conditions and an increase in those who prefer less saline, right? Um, or more brackish water. It's not surprising that most of the fauna here are associated with high saline seagrass meadows like Pine Islands around, again, like pi around Pine Island today. But these trends do suggest changing in local ecological conditions as evidenced through this shift in um, species composition throughout these deposits. So there's a, again, there's a drastic decrease in species that prefer higher salinities after Cal 80, 1230 to 1255. Again, we have the Little Ice Age 
starting sometime circa 8,200. Um, it's also during this time that the Central Canal, a four kilometer canal that runs the extent of the island actually was constructed and likely increased freshwater runoff into Pine Island Sound. So I have three possible factors that could influence these changes. One, I have a lowering of relative sea level um, in this area. Two, there's increased rainfall. Um, so three, increased freshwater input, all of which would affect local salinity regimes and all likely work together to create a combined effect on these local environments. But this could only have been understood by the use of these archeological deposits. And by depositing these middens along the shoreline, they created an environment attractive to many of these gastropod species. Again, these small um, species that were likely not used as a food source. Um, and so in doing so, these deposits provide a resolution and environment not, not normally captured in natural deposits. So they were very attractive um, to a wide variety of species. And so here's an artist's reconstruction prior to my time here. Um, of what this midden might have looked like. So let's go down to Mount Key. Mount Key is located in Estero Bay here, um, which is shallow microtidal bay, generally considered a sub estuary of that larger Charlotte Harbor estuarine system. Um, it receives fresh water directly from three creeks and two rivers. Um, Modern salinity ranges generally on monthly average between 25 to 32 parts per thousand and depths across the bay are also pretty shallow at average one meter, but can reach up to three meters and really high tides in some areas. So Mount Key is really cool. Um, it's a 51 hectare or 126 acre completely anthropogenically built island composed primarily of shell midden and like Pineland is a complex arrangement of midden mounds, canals, water courts, and many other features. Um, by 81,000, two largest mounds here and here reach their pinnacle heights of 10 meters and six meters. Mound one contains a large mound top structure with at least three phases of construction and repair beginning around 80,000, which likely served as the seat of socio-political organization for the Calusa. And this is definitely in place at the time of European colonization. Um, there are Spanish accounts that this house was able to hold of around a thousand people. Take that with a grain of salt, but nonetheless, um, this is an artist's rendition of it. It was a big house. Um, a large canal bisects these um, mounds one and two like Pineland and extends across this entire island at 365 meters long and averages about 30 meters wide. Um, at the canal's southern end, southern end at the bases of mound one and two, you'll see these two um, features called uh, East Court and West Court um, that mirror each other. And these are water impoundment features. Um, previous research work um, demonstrates they probably functioned as areas for the storage of live surplus fish, which I will get back to in a minute. Um, I will note that this canal and the Pineland Canal um, would have required constant maintenance and um, a lot of labor and time input into making sure these were clear and runnable. Um, they hold water today, not well, um, but there would have required constant maintenance. So huge labor input. Um, so for Mount Key to evaluate changing local environmental conditions and then how they're tied to resource management strategies, I um, got a series of paired radiocarbon dates and stable isotopic measurements from three hard clam shells pictured here. Um, after bisecting these shells down their longest axis, um, three radiocarbon samples were drilled out of one of the resulting halves. And so I have nine new radiocarbon dates here. And I'll explain why in a minute. But um, so these dates were then incorporated into a Bayesian chronological framework. And um, lost my place in my notes um, to evaluate these dates. And so with known age separations, I generalized to 10 years. Um, so this is the same D sequence protocol that I used for all the Pineland dates. Um, this provides maximum accountability for the, or the lifespan of this organism while maintaining model sensitivity. And if anybody has any questions, I can go into that more, but I won't here. Um, the resulting timeframe aligns with 
other data suggesting activity along the West Court, so this water impoundment area, the use of these courts and the period during which um, the second and third phases of the construction of that large structure on top of Mound One um, were occurring. So 80, 1100 to 1500. So this then provided a temporal framework for stable isotope analysis. Hard clams precipitate their shells near oxygen isotopic equilibrium with ambient water conditions, which is a function of evaporation, precipitation, and terrestrial runoff, all of which affect local salinity. Um, I recognize there are multi multiple variables here, but they're still meaningful tools to interpret um, past environmental conditions. So from the other half of the bisected shell, um, I took 50 isotopic samples um, per shell. So sh these shells grow a lot like trees. Um, they put down shell material um, throughout their lifespan. So it's a great record of environmental conditions. Um, the key here is to remember that this data represents a 15 to 20 year time span and aren't single data points. Um, seasonal trends and patterns of salinity in Charlotte Harbor suggest summer rainy season results in a decrease in salinity and more negative water values. Um, all three shells record more positive values, meaning cooler summer temperatures and or drier summers than modern shells. When shells are arranged in chronological order, they demonstrate trending more negative values and thus more negative summer values um, over time, indicating, indicating increased precipitation during the rainy summer seasons and or warmer conditions. Now, this actually contradicts overall global signatures, but it could represent um, you know, one of these periods of high variability in the Little Ice Age. Nonetheless, it just it demonstrates the need for more localized data sets and more understanding of these of this localized variability. Um, and again, more than just three shells, but time and money. So, um, Mount Key Zor, um, again, some tabular data around 4,000 um, identified vertebrate. Um, uh, bones and then estimated around 460 minimum number of individuals, which tabulates out to around 122 taxa. Again, unsurprisingly, 80% um, bony fishes. Um, high species richness and species composition here um, suggests procurement from a really wide range of estuarine and marine conditions, which aligns with our isotopic signatures. So essential to Calusa's success was just as society's reliant on large scale agriculture was their ability to mediate changes to the location and availability of resources as a result of environmental change. Um, a recent study demonstrates the capacity of the Calusa to intensify and formalize fish resource management and that's through the creation um, of these features to hold live fish surpluses. Um, Critical for aquatic resources, the production of surplus fish requires adequate strategies for storage and food preservation, um, which storage can take many forms like drying, smoking, salting, etc. cetera. Um, the creation of these large surpluses was likely a strategy that uh, supported increasing political complexity among these groups. However, storage would have been difficult in these subtropical and tropical temperature and humidity of southwestern Florida, which present major problems when it comes to storing plants and animals. Um, while we don't know the specific water quality characteristics, um, we do understand the hydrological capability of them to effective, effectively hold water. Um, previous research demonstrates um, extensive knowledge related to the architectural engineering of these landscapes, but what we also need to know um, for these things to be successful was the knowledge of biological and ecological consequences these types of, of these types of microenvironments, as well as the biological and ecological thresholds for the fish within them. Um, I think they're probably most closely related to a coastal lagoon, so a body of water with a, restrict, with a um, restricted inlet here. This would have um, decreased exchange with more open waters and would have limited water circulation and dissolved oxygen content, increasing the nutrient con concentration of these waters, um, which would have promoted primary production with because of these low flushing rates. So um, they probably created conditions that were really stressful to the organisms residing in them. 
And through an examination of these zoarch samples, um, we see a consistent reliance on a few fish worthy of discussion. So more specifically, we have two species of catfish, toadfish, mullet, sheep's head, and burfish. Um, these are all the most abundant fishes in these samples. And here I argue um, that the, they all served a major role. Um, <clears throat> they, have, they all have high tolerances for a range of salinities and most can tolerate um, waters with low dissolved oxygen. The ability of them to these fishes to endure varying environmental conditions likely played a large part in their prefer preferential use within these courts. Um, the choice to use such hardy fish demonstrates they possessed intimate knowledge of the ecological, hydrological, and biological consequences of creating such features um, for the, the creation of surplus stores of food. Um, and so they chose species that were going to work. Um, the presence in these samples are from all time periods and from other Calusa sites. So they know about these fish and they've been using them for a long time. However, there's one that's weird. Um, and these are burfishes. Um, there's two species, porcupine fish and burfish. They both have modified dental configurations um, and possess scales. Um, they can inflate their body as a defense mechanism. They also contain a deadly toxin um, that can cause a series of ailments and even death if prepared incorrectly. Um, these are commonly found throughout um, Latin America, Caribbean, and the U.S. Southeast. But they're, um, while they may have high numbers of elements present, there's only a few fish. However, here at Mount Key, we have deposits um, rich in numbers of individuals. Um, you can see the amount recovered here is high. Um, of all the deposits, the only elements recovered are these modified dental plates here. No spines and no other elements. It's not for lack of trying. Um, this unprecedented number of burfish probably re represents a specialized production and use of this toxic resource not previously identified in the U.S. Southeast. Um, I don't think these fish were used um, as bycatch. The, the, they transcend explanations of bycatch, and they probably weren't used as food. Um, they're not easy to butcher, um, and they don't provide a whole lot of, of meat as well. Um, um, so Calusa lifeways were clearly highly in tune with these local ecosystems and then integrated them into multiple um, institutions, both at Pineland and Mount Key. And so this research combined several approaches um, to understanding the local ecological conditions that related to global climate change, complexities of Calusa subsistence practices, and the ties between changing local ecologies um, and Calusa economies. The unique deposits at Pineland, when they're considered within this high resolution um, chronology, provide a collection of invertebrate species with which we see changing conditions to those of lower salinity, which would have influenced the location and availability of species within proximity to the site. And this actually um, corresponds to the isotopic data at Mount Key. Um, so at Mount Key, we can, act we can more accurately address the timing of local climatic fluctuations by combining dates and isotopic measurements on, on clams, the single clams themselves. Um, this provides more local understandings of precipitation slash salinity um, that would have served as key factors in managing economic institutions. And so I interpret the isotopic and zoarch data presented here to demonstrate that the global signatures of the Little Ice Age actually fail to capture the variability and likely very amenable environmental conditions in Southwest southwestern Florida at this time. And I hope that I've also demonstrated the need for getting more data. Um, this data is not sufficient to capture um, that kind of variability. Um, so it's critical not only to understanding, you know, these ecological and sociopolitical histories of these groups, but they also provides a way to evaluate archaeological data more meaningfully for environmental care, you know, you know past environmental reconstruction um, data. So the various engineering projects at both of these sites were likely used as a way to buffer against environmental variations and support complex political, social, and economic institutions. And so ultimately, they were able to foster resiliency in the face of shifting um, ecological conditions, right? Despite environmental variability of this period, they were able to transform their traditions of resource use and adopt new ones, 
that's something's going on with birdfish um, that would have supported increasing complex, increasingly complex social, political, and socioeconomic institutions that then culminated into the form and function that was witnessed by Spanish colonizers in the 16th century. Um, so the data here is not congruent with these um, general notions of the Little Ice Age. And so by using these general trends, it actually doesn't capture what people were experiencing. And so then how can this translate into uh, how do these research themes translate into research in Illinois? Um, and I'll go back to the three research themes that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Um, one, local signatures of global climate events. Um, this is going to require, you know, rivering mollusks as records of environmental change. This will require some modern studies um, to understand the local influences to the isotopic composition of these species. But I think it's going to be really cool. Hopefully it works. Um, trends and resource utilization. Um, I want to look at long-term perspectives on riverine fisheries in both Illinois and Mississippi rivers, um, which is something that archaeological data can really contribute to. Um, and then further, the kinds of labor and social organization involved in the use of these resources. Um, and then three, um, I have a deer project in mind. Um, this is the movement of deer foodstuffs and this, you know, how deer, um, movement of deer foodstuffs, byproducts across the landscape which then um, you can look at the um, social networks of interaction across the Midwest, starting in the American bottom. Um, so this is also gonna be isotopic, um, probably strontium, um, and maybe even some ADNA, um, we'll see. So that's all I have for you today. Um, acknowledgements, thanks to these key players as um, guidance and support throughout this research, as well as these institutions um, who also provided lots of people um, from these institutions provided guidance and support throughout this research. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Isabel. Um, looks like we have some time for questions. Uh, so if you are ready, I will get the ball rolling. Um, so the first one comes from Mary who asked, was the cordage from Pineland analyzed? If so, what was it constructed with? Um, so we're still working on that. Um, that is on what exactly that's from um, and what it's made from. Um, Lee Newsom at Flagler College has been working on identifying um, what the cordage is and what it's made from. Um, so to be determined. Thank you. Uh, from Bill, do you think the burfish were harvested and processed for their toxins? That's a great question, and I have no idea. Um, you know, it could be that there is a byproduct of, if I'll go back, let me go back to, there could be a product involving spines. Um, you know, since I have no spines at all, um, there could be some sort of byproduct being used, being constructed from the spines. Um, these are really actually taphonomically stable elements, um, meaning that they preserve well. Um, I have friends, you know, all across the Southeast and even in the Pacific who um, have burfish remains in their deposits um, and they have tons of spines. So I, I don't know. Um, there's a lot of controversy about the presence of toxins in these fish. Um, most, the most recent studies that they, you know, they're, they are, they're, this toxin is present. So the toxin is similar to um, fugu, um, which comes from, um, it's the same tetrodontiformes, but it's a, from a different family. So this is, that's the smooth puffer. Um, they don't have these modified scales. Um, I think that's a great question for future research. I'm not sure how to get at it or um, you know, where to start from there. But the answer to that is, I don't know. <laughs> um, so we've got, Mary is wondering again about the burfish, um, whether toxins are contained in the skin um, or about ethnographic records for use in ritual. Yeah, um, so 
they, it is present in multiple organs um, and skin. Um, there is ethnographic evidence in the Caribbean for it being used in voodoo practices, um, but there is not ethnographic evidence in the Southeast. Um, so that's really what we have to go on. There's ethnographic evidence um, from Melanesia of not the toxin, but the skin with the burrs still intact being constructed into um, different, you know, there's, I think there was a helmet um, and other, you know, warlike implements. I don't think, I'm not using that ethnographic analogy to say that's what's going on in the Southeast, um, but those are the two um, like major ethnographic sources for the use of these fish um, that I've been able to locate thus far. Um, so in the Caribbean, um, there is evidence for the use of that toxin in um, voodoo practices. Okay, and Laura is also wondering if the toxin could have been used as a psychotropic. Um, yeah, right. I mean, birdfish are awesome. Um, so there is one paper that does talk about the psychotropic effects of this toxin. Um, so it's a to it's a def it's a to this tetrodotoxin is a toxin that affects the nervous system. Um, so the voodoo in practice in the Caribbean, um, if I'm remembering correctly, is, a, is part of a zombification process um, where people are brought back. Um, I am not an expert on that practice. And so I'm not gonna go any farther into you know, what that exactly entails. I have read one account of it being used as a psychotropic substance, substance but um, nothing else. So more research on burfish needs to happen just all around in general. Okay, we've got a couple trickling in here. Um, uh, so from Michael, based on your findings and chronologies, do you think local environmental changes would be recognized one generation to the next or only on longer centennial scales? I um, would not say that I have enough data, um, even though I have a ton of data um, to confidently answer that question. But I think that these environments have a great potential for those effects to be, for those effects to be, you know, felt on a generational scale, um, you know, if not at the centennial scale. Um, but I think, I think there's a great potential for a generational scale um, issue. So yeah, I, but I think I still, I think there's, we need more data. Um, you know, I have a lot, but I still don't have as much as I would like to, to be able to confidently say that. Okay, hey, we've got one from Tim uh, who says, nice talk. Uh, he's wondering if you've thought more about your potential Midwestern mollusk and climate change interests, especially what climatic period you might be interested in and what the mollusks might tell you about it. Um, let me go down to here. Um, so, you know, different types of mollusks in different environments can have um, you know, the controls on what those isotopic signatures say are different. Um, so it depends on the species that I'm looking at. I haven't solidified exactly um, what species we would be targeting. Um, you know, if we wanted to do um, archeological samples, we're gonna have to choose something that's, very, that's more robust. Um, something that's going to preserve since we have very low preservation of um, shell remains here. Um, we would have to choose something where we actually could get data from. Um, so, you know, these systems are going to be largely um, influenced by the amount of, you know, if it's a closed system like a lake, we're looking at evaporation. So the isotopes are going to talk about dry periods versus wet periods um, and temperature as well. And then if you have open systems, right, um, it's, it gets a lot more complicated. Um, so I think that that's going to be really species specific 
as well as question specific. Um, so I'm still working on that is, is the answer. Um, and, you know, based on time period, still, um, still narrowing down exactly when would be um, feasible to start with. Yeah. Uh, from Richard, is there any evidence to distinguish holding captured live fish storage versus raising fish? Uh, live fish storage would seem to indicate fishing methods that did not significantly injure the caught fish as opposed to methods such as spear fishing that would injure fish. Any recovered artifacts that indicate fishing methods? Yeah, I mean, we have lots of nets. And so that cordage um, from Pineland, we have nets in um, cordage and knots and sections of nets, lots of um, shell net weights. Um, so there's a lot of netting um, of fish happening. Um, you know, we do have other artifacts that could be um, spearing, but that if you think about in terms of labor costs, um, if you're trying to produce surpluses of fish, you're going to net them because you can get a large, much larger quantity of fish um, for your time. Um, so we do have, you know, a lot of evidence for netting. Um, I would say that's the predominant um, artifact class in terms of fishing um, is netting. Okay, they keep coming in. Uh, so this one's from Laura who asks, um, is there evidence of, and excuse me if I pronounce this wrong, uh, Ilex vomitorium and or Cassena consumption? Are there beakers or shell cups? <clears throat> yeah, um, as far as Ilex is confirmed, so this is black drink um, and, you know, shell cups and and definitely have shell cups. Um, and I'm trying to remember off the top of my head if we have Ilex at, um, I think it's been identified at Pineland. I can't remember off the top of my head, um, but there is ethnographic accounts, um, you know, across the Southeast. Um, so I haven't looked at the plant in the um, botanical identifications in a while. A lot of it were still are still being worked on, especially for um, the Pineland units, um, because there's a lot of material um, that was recovered from those waterlogged middens. Um, so that's gonna be really exciting when that comes out. Um, we, have a, we, have, we do have a lot of evidence of canoe making, <laughs> as a side note. Um, so that's pretty cool. But as far as I like, I can't remember off the top of my head. And, um, but we definitely have shell cups. And um, I mean, it's highly likely. Okay. Um, and what about large storm events like hurricanes? Do you have evidence for hurricane deposits? Yes. Yeah, so um, that's another, you know, another thing that we, um, that I have been questioned about. The, especially the Pineland deposits. Um, but we do have um, evidence for hurricane deposits at other places in Pineland, um, which is actually where, there's the one reconstruction, um, really far. There. Um, this reconstruction was based off of. Um, so we do have evidence of hurricane deposits and there are a lot of people working on um, you know, sort of nailing down paleo tempestology and the frequency of hurricane events. Um, I don't think that these deposits are, have any hurricane deposits in them. Hey, thank you. Um, from Charles says, thanks for the cautionary note on global signatures of climatic change. Nevertheless, important oscillations in hemispheric climatic variability during the Little Ice Age have been attributed to volcanic forcing, uh, for example, in the mid 1400s and late 1600s. These likely affected the Southeast. Would you describe the changes you see as episodic? Do you think maritime economies are more buffered from climatic spikes than agricultural economies? 
Um, so I'll start with the first part of that. Um, do I think that it's episodic? I don't think that I have enough isotopic data um, to really address that issue. Um, so this is a call out there for any, um, you know, potential PhD students or get more isotopic data. Um, we need more environmental data in order to, you know, answer whether these are the signatures that we have are resultant from episodic events like volcanic climate forcing. Um, the Gulf Coast of, you know, the the Gulf and Florida are um, influenced by a number of larger climatic um, uh, patterns. So the North Atlantic Oscillation influences it. It's, in, it's influenced by INSO events. It's influenced by the intertropical convergence zone. Um, so you have a really, it's a really complex mixing of different climatic patterns um, that I think we need more data for. Like I said, I only have three shells um, and to me, that's, you know, that's low, but it's still a start. Um, and then do I think that maritime communities are better buffered? I then, you know, these maritime communities in particular are better buffered against climatic change as opposed to those reliant on large scale agriculture. Um, you know, here, I think that it's really hard to compare. Right, they obviously the the Calusa knew about maize and did not partake. Decided actively to not partake in um, maize row crop agricultural production. Um, the Spanish actually brought maize with them, um, and the Spanish um, replied something with, "I hope you brought slaves to do that because we're not doing it." Um, so they're actively choosing strategies that um are working for them um so i think it just depends on you know i think it's very environment environment dependent clearly these strategies worked um for a long time um and you know maize worked for people for a long time in other places it just i think it's environmentally dependent thank you um you have basal deposits that predate the little ice age and the pineland sample so before circa 80, 1200, um, what can you then say about the medieval warm period and the change to the Little Ice Age? Mm -hmm. Oh, you're still muted. There we go. Okay, um, so... These dates right here, there's actually um, quite a shift um, in what this, this lowest level dates to um, compared to all of these other dates, which are pretty tightly in, in a sequence. Um, I'm gonna go now to this. Um, I think that these are exactly that. It's basal deposits, and I can't be super confident that that date actually is, comes from the basal deposits of these middens. Um, it turns into a very white sand. And so, you know, I am more confident in these other dates than I am for that. So the Indian, these dates actually start, you know, around circa 80, 1200. Um, so I can't really answer that transition, but I can talk about the early um, trends in that onset. Okay, thank you. Um, looks like we have time for one more. Um, what does the mobility or plasticity of the resource base suggest about cultural institutions? Mute it again. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that that is a pointed strategy um, to deal with um, these climatically sensitive environments is the short answer to that. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, thank you all for joining us this evening and submitting your questions. Um, thank you again to Isabel for sharing your research. Our next virtual lecture will be on April 23rd with Dr. Tamira Brennan. Uh, she'll be discussing late Mississippian landscapes in Southern Illinois. 
If you want to watch any of our previous talks in this series, you can visit our YouTube channel. Thank you and have a great weekend, everyone.